What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Cover Band Confidential Podcast. My guest this week is a multi-instrumentalist who shared the stage with everyone from Corey Taylor of Slipknot to Tracy Lawrence or even Lizzie Hale. He is currently the touring keyboard player and room manager for Vixen and spends the rest of his time playing on Broadway in Nashville. Tyson Leslie, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so for those people who are listening to this and may not necessarily be familiar with you, which is crazy to think about because as far as I know, every single person that I know that ah. plays music knows you somehow. Um, can I you kind of explain uh, your journey from your kind of start with music and, and how you ended up in Nashville and what you currently are up to? Well, I basically started playing in, when I was in high school, playing in clubs and stuff like that and um, trying to write songs and be that, you know, we we're going to make it one day kind of kids, you know, like everybody, a lot of people do as they're, teenagers and whatnot i remember playing and opening up for bands that like you know that i hung on my wall or that were i'd read about in magazines and stuff like that but then as soon as we got done they'd kick us out because we weren't old enough to hang out in the club anymore so yeah. they'd be like oh man so we have to listen to the band outside and stuff like I, I i specifically remember listening to cinderella outside of a place called the lone star in kansas city and being super sad that i couldn't go inside and watch them i'm like they're just right on the other side of the wall and i can't see them and um so i did a lot of that kind of stuff in my high school and college days and then around 1998 i joined a band called simplexity and Funny, I was just telling the story the other day because it's it's such a crucial stepping stone for where I'm at now. It was an all black band. They were all in their 40s, and I was like in my early 20s. I was like 21. I was pretty young, and they were playing everything from Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Cool and the Gang, and all the all the big hits for you know those kind. But they also got really deep into. Bands that you don't really hear about as much, or you don't hear people covering like Lakeside and SOS bands. A lot, of, a lot of, I guess, you know, classic black oriented funk music. And for me, the education in that was paramount. It was so big for me to learn from these guys and <clears throat> learn how to be in a band and listen. And one thing that was really interesting, and especially since your whole thing is based around cover bands and stuff like that, is that for the first several months, the keyboard player would not let me play keyboard parts. And it was okay. infuriating to me. But uh, he's like, hey, man, give me hand claps and cowbell. So I would I would sit there with my keyboard and play percussion, hand percussion. Like, like I'd have a tambourine going eighth notes in my left. I'd have a cowboy, cowbell going quarter notes with my like index finger and hand claps on note two in the floor with my, my thumb. And I was just like, I know these songs. I know how to play. Like, why don't you let me play? And I found out much later after all of that has kind of said and done, he's like, man, you needed to learn how to pay attention and listen and watch how the band works with each other. And that's why I didn't let you play at first. And I was like, oh, all right. And I did because I, when you're doing that, there's nothing else to do but pay attention to what everybody's yeah. doing because like, it's the most boring part of the, you know, because we had one of those singers that was like, and to this day is the best front man I've ever worked with ever. Like he's just, he was just extraordinary. We would play Brick House by the Commodores for 40 minutes sometimes. <laughs> and it never got boring because he was so good at, work in the audience and work in the band and Jeff, the guy who hired me and that was the original keyboard player and all that kind of stuff. He taught me how to write a set list without writing a set list. Like he never, we never had a real set list uh, written out. So he never knew what was coming next, but he would musically lead one song into the next song into the next song. And we rarely ever like took a, there was never a pause in music from when we started until we took a break. I learned a lot from that too, of how you keep the dance floor moving and stuff like that. And so I did that for eight years. And at one point, my drummer, Gogo Ray, and I uh, got bored of playing Brick House every damn night of our lives and all that stuff. We wanted to do something different. So in 2006, we left the band and we started a new band called 90 Minutes and it was all 90s music. Mm -hmm. And that was the result of, I was in a touring band, an original band called Pomeroy and we were tour all over the universe. And we were playing in Manhattan, Kansas at a frat party and this this kid, 
uh, his name was Mikey Needleman, was playing a solo gig between all the bands at this frat thing, whatever it was. So between bands was this guy playing like Sister Hazel and Matchbox 20 and on all this stuff. And every, all these kids in the audience were losing their minds and they were singing every word. And I was like, Ooh, light bulb moment. This is, these are the people that are going to see shows and getting ready to be the people that are going to be patroning clubs because they're in college or they're the, they're about 21 or, or slightly older, or slightly younger, whatever. Right. And, and this is going to be the next wave of entertainment, like for young people. And so I called Gogo the next day and I was like, Hey man, I think I know how we can get out of playing you know, break house every night of our lives. Check this out. And so let's do a nineties band and start. And I just took down all the songs that he played. And then I thought about all the other songs that were kind of in that same vibe, you know, everything from, what is it like semi charm life and all those kinds of songs that were really popular at the time. And that's how we started the band. And we did that for six years mm -hmm. and, and it, also became really successful. It was super fun. And the criteria of that band was it could be any genre you want as long as the song came out between uh, January 1st, 1990 and December 31st, 1999. Yeah. Everything was fair game. So that the fun part about that, I remember growing up in the 90s and being in high school and college and stuff, I, uh, the 90s were kind of like, uh, okay, as a uh, going through it as coming out of the hair metal thing and all that stuff that I was really into. Yeah. And then trying to figure out how to welcome Nirvana and Soundgarden and all that stuff with open arms, which eventually I did, you know, but at the time when it was all out, it was just kind of happening and changing and you were living day to day life and figuring out high school years and things like that. And so it didn't, it wasn't until I started in the band I was like, man, 90s music was really the first decade of absolute 100% diversity. Like, yeah. in so many different ways that were all in the forefront in popular, like, radio ready music. So, you had your Matchbox 20s and your bands like that. And, but you also had Ricky Martin and Jennifer Lopez brought out the Latin movement came back and the swing movement came back with Big Bad Booty Daddy. And yeah. Brian Setzer, and then you had metal changed drastically with bands like Korn and even Slipknot put out the record, you know, the first record in '99. Yep. And then, but even like White Zombie and Sepultura and, and, and Pantera, it just the games were changing. Even the bands that were big before, like Megadeth, were changing in a and evolving in, in a really cool way. And Metallica became the biggest metal band in the world in the '90s, you know, with the Black Album. And country I had a whole new face of superstars from Garth Brooks and Shania Twain and all those people. And hip hop it was humongous. Oh and yeah, it was awesome. It was like the it was so fun. It was party music. It was Puff Daddy, you know, sampling every '80s song he could get his hands on and, and rapping over it. And you're like, oh, this is familiar. Okay, cool. And then you know, now I've got, I I I'm sound like the old guy, but a lot of hip hop stuff sounds like a second grader playing around with a little. EX7 had accidentally coming up with a loop and then they just push record and they're like, cool, that's great. Somebody's going to rap over it. You know, it's just, I, I, it's not, <laughs> I don't know. It's just the art of, of that kind of creation just disappeared. So we did the 90s band for six years and then around 2009, 2010, that's when I started doing the Corey Taylor gang. And that, that led me to a lot of open doors and then a lot of closed doors really fast because that, and that gig was only about a year and a half old of of work, and then it was over. And I was, yeah. at that point, I was like, "Well, shit, what am I going to do? I don't really know." I felt like I my career of trying to be a rock star, trying to work for one, was over because I was, you know, I was peak, reaching forty, and like, who's going to be calling this old guy, you know, to come do stuff at this point? And so I just went back to working at a. I tried to save my marriage by not playing music for a year, and that drove me completely bonkers to the point where I wrote a song called "Wasting Time" about that exact thing. And when that didn't work, I ended up working at a Howl at the Moon a Dueling Piano Bar in Kansas City, and I didn't know what Dueling Pianos was or anything like that. I was just going into a record store or not, a music store to buy some cables and stuff. And the, one of the managers there said, you need to talk to this lady that's working, that's in here right now. 
you guys would really work well together. She is the entertainment director for Howl at the Moon. A Dueling Pianos thing. I was like, uh, I'd seen Dueling Pianos one other time and it was terrible. It was really bad. I was like, I don't think I want to do that, man. I, I'm, you know, playing uh, Sweet Caroline every night and telling bad jokes just doesn't sound like a great time to me. <laughs> and inevitably, though, I met this lady, Amy, and she said, yeah, we're, well, we're, you know, we're open five nights a week. This is how much it pays. I'm like, holy crap, that's more than I've ever made in my life. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, and so, uh, that I was, now I'm intrigued. And so I was doing a, uh, I was filling in for a queen tribute band on bass, which is a very challenging thing to do by the way. Yeah. And, um, and I went to that rehearsal for that show and then I went by Howl at the Moon after just to kind of check out what it was and is walking in and they were all playing Somebody to Love by Queen. I was like, well, that's oddly coincidental. And they were doing it really well. And it was her and two other guys who are still like some of my closest friends now. And um, like, okay, this if this is what it is, then this is cool. I can do this. Like these guys are amazing and they're really good and they're playing fun songs and whatever. So I just started going there every like three or four days a week and just taking notes and really paying attention, like writing down every song that they do, seeing what songs are being repeated night after night. What are the popular ones? What's going on? But more importantly, and maybe most importantly, what are they saying between songs when right. they're not playing? Right. Because I think the hardest part about being in a cover band or being an entertainer in general is that how do you connect with your audience in a way where they want to come back and see you? I think so much of that has to do with that charisma and that stuff that you exude on stage. And they, I always tell people like, you want to give that vibe, like you want this band playing in your living room with all your friends and stuff like that, because yeah. especially yeah. in a piano bar scenario, you want these guys just hanging out in your house. You want to give those people that kind of vibe because if they like, you as a person, then they're going to request songs. They're not going to be intimidated by you or whatever. If you come off arrogant or you come off this way or that way, then the audience may not, you know, make, you're not going to make as much money. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the best guys that I've seen in that business are the guys that I'm like, man, I just want to be friends with that dude because he just seems like such a fun person. And so I try to keep that in mind. And when I do all that stuff, and then also piano bar shows are all based on requests. So yeah. Big song, you get all these handful. And if you go to my Facebook page, there's a whole library of wrong requests. Like people will be like, you know, play Piano Man by Bruce Springsteen or something. It's just like, what, really? Like, but um, my my point of it is, it's just like because of that job, I got to know thousands more songs and really, really fast. Uh, uh, well, not really fast, but faster than I normally probably would have learned so many right. these songs. I mean, because so day after day, you're getting songs. Oh, I've never heard that. So I take a set of headphones or in ear little earbuds with me. And when people bring up something I don't know, while the other guy's playing a song, I'm listening to their song going, okay. And, you know, a, okay, so one, four, six, five. Okay, it's like every other song. Cool. And I'm <laughs> thinking about the melody and whatever. And then yeah. when he's done, I play it before I forget it. And then that's kind of how I get through those kind of requests. And that part's fun, too. Well, and it seems like, I mean, dueling pianos is such a specific format. Like you have to know the, you know, the way that that particular kind of gig runs. And it seems like you were the, when you saw, okay, well, this is something that's worth my time and effort. You really like went to work on studying it as a medium and right. what, it, you know, what are the things you need to do and, and, you know, what, what's going to work and what doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's that, so that's, that's the way that you got to do it. Like in a band, your drummer leads the show, right? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, your drummer's setting the tempo for everything and whatever, and you're looking to him to kind of, or her to transition or whatever it is. But in a dueling piano show, the piano player leads the show. So if yeah. I'm playing, if the drummer thinks I'm playing too fast, too bad, play how fast I'm playing it because I'm leading the show. Yeah. And so that was a something weird to get around and like kind of understand like, oh, okay. And especially when I'm drumming, like, I'm like, okay, so, oh my God, that guy's playing the song so fast, but okay, here we go. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I'll just play it that fast. Cause that's how it, so that was a little bit of something to kind of understand. And, and, and that was different than being in a band, um, backing vocals and just kind of learning like, 
Okay, you just listen for, okay, what's he going to sing? Okay, I'll take the fifth, or I'll take the third, or I'll take whatever it is that the other person or people aren't singing, and trying to figure those kinds of things out. Whereas in a band, you usually work that stuff ahead of time, you know, yeah. or whatever, rehearsals or anything like that. Um, so dealing pianos is so much more about being on the fly and in the moment right then and there. And, um, and then in 2015, I was just burned out. I had played every venue in Kansas City that I'd ever wanted to play. I, I mean, I had played everything. I played the dirtiest toilet venues to the like the you know Starlight Theater, like the big the biggest venues in the town in the city. And I had also at that point had played with every single person that I'd ever like looked up to and read about as a kid and all that stuff. Like they were my heroes. I, I worked with them in some capacity or another. And was just like, man, what am I going to do now? Like, I don't know what else is left. And the Corey Taylor thing didn't work out or whatever. And, and that was, I felt like was my one shot, really. Yeah. And I got this random call from this guy named Rich Redman. And Rich Redman plays for uh, this country guy, Jason Aldean. But mm-hmm. Rich had been through town with Jason and sat in with my 90 minute in my 90s band, you know. And me being an idiot, my old oh, country guy, let's give him friends in little places. Like the most boring song yeah. to play on Trump, which was dumb. But, you know, looking back on it, like I didn't know any better, I guess. And not knowing that he was like one of the baddest kick ass drummers in the period. And yeah. uh, I could have probably thrown him anything and he would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> but we did that and and so he knew me as a bass player because I played bass in 90 minutes um, and everything else I mostly played keys or guitar mostly a lot of keyboards right yeah <clears throat> and like hey I need I, I, I think I've got a thing that you would be good for it was a country band it was like a new band I still to this day have no idea what band it was or what he was trying to do because it was he was like you know, I said 100 bucks a gig it's like be right, you know, traveling in a van and trailer. And like, dude, I'm 40 years old. I've got three <laughs> kids. Like, I can't be doing that anymore. I did that in my 20s and I had a blast. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I would love yeah. to do that if I was single and 20 something. I would do it oh, again yeah, absolutely. in a second. But I can't do that now. So, what else do you have? And he said, Well, I want you to, what do you want to do? Uh, what are you trying to get out of your career? And I was like, I'm not really sure. And he said, okay, hang up the phone, take a whole night, think about it, and be honest with yourself. What do you really, really want out of your career? Call me back tomorrow, and we'll figure it out. Okay. I called him the next day, and I was like, honestly, man, I just want to be doing what you're doing before I'm too old and fat, and nobody wants to call me anymore for any of this kind of stuff. He's like, well, you're not old enough uh, at all. Like, He's like, most of the guys out on the road are older than you are. And I was like, oh, okay. So I didn't know that. And He's like, if you really want to do all these things that you want to do and you say you want to do, you've got to move here to Nashville. Yeah. And the magic words were, you have to be present to win. Like, okay, that makes sense. He's like, if you want to take an audition or a meeting or any of those kinds of things, you've got to be here so you can, A, meet the people to get those auditions and stuff like that, but B, not be trying to book flights and do all this stuff. Like, you got to be, yeah, cool, I'll see you in 30 minutes. I was like, okay, that made yeah. sense to me as well. So I... Me and, me and my uh, my girl were kind of at a crossroads in our own relationship. Like, are we going to do this or not? And so we both decided, let's just go. Let's try this out. If it doesn't work, we'll just go back. And we we moved out here to Nashville at the end of June, um, early July of 2015. And in September, I was jumping on a bus with Tracy Lawrence playing country music for the first time in my life. And it was terrifying because... <laughs> I didn't even meet Tracy until five minutes before I went on stage with them uh-huh. at the surf ballroom uh-huh. in, in Iowa. And uh, that's how it is. No rehearsal, no nothing. It was just like, here, here's the songs. You know, it was, 30, it was like 32, 36 songs, something like that. You got a week and a half. See you in Iowa. Okay. Shit. So I'm sitting in this apartment just driving my like neighbors under me nuts with my foot tapping and like playing through these songs over and over and over and and you have to understand too, like when Tracy Lawrence was popular, I wasn't listening to country music. I was right. listening to Rage Against the Machine and Tool and Alice in Chains and stuff like that. So totally. I did not know any of his songs at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like everything was brand new to me, which was exciting, but also kind of scary because, you know, I, I, I didn't know any of that kind of music. I'd never played it before. And I didn't realize how incredibly challenging and, and difficult. 90s country um, 
recorded and live can be. Like it's very honky tonk piano. It's very busy. Yeah. And there's a lot going on. And the guy that played before me, I was learning off of board tapes and holy crap, that guy was incredible. His name is Steve Poole. Incredible, mm -hmm. incredible keyboard player. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to ever get to be able to play like this, but I'm going to try my best. <laughs> you know. And um, I lasted about a month on that gig. And then we both realized, yep, I, this, this isn't for me. This isn't working out. Yeah. And so I, I got cut on that gig. And I remember being really, really bummed out thinking, oh, man, I'm the new guy to town. And I got this really cool gig before all these other people who've been waiting for a gig like that for years. And I already lost it. you know. And I got to go face all these musicians that I'm going to see next week at this jam and be like, and they're, they're going to say, how's the gig? And I'm going to be like, I don't have the gig anymore. And just oh, be completely. And sure enough, the very first, I, I went into the rehearsal for this jam. And the first guy I ran into is a Taylor Swift drummer, Matt. And he's like, how's the gig going? I'm like, <laughs> um, well, you know. And then the second guy I ran into um, is a bass player for another big country act or whatever. And same thing. And and But Luis was like, man, I, actually, Matt, both were, uh, they were both like, look around this room. Because at the time, that jam was pretty exclusive to guys who were side guys. They had to play in it, you know, for an artist or something yeah. like that. And he's like, every single one of these guys have been fired from a gig. And he's like, every one of them. Like, you just got out of the way early. And I was like, oh, well, that, that's a nice way of looking at it, I guess. It's like, no, seriously. Like, I got fired from Lady Annabellum, and now I play for the biggest artist in the world. I moved up in a great way. I was like, oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. yeah, yes, you did. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that was really um, hopeful to kind of, have those people still in your corner even after you fail right away when you come into town, a town like this where it's doggy dog and there's lots of sharks but man there's way more like there are far more like good people especially at that level of the business yeah that are are just good people that help each other out and all that stuff then there are people that are trying to you know, cut corners or take people out you know or whatever so that's kind of what led me into out here. And then, so after the Tracy Lawrence gig was over, I took a, I just went to, back to playing at the piano bar for a while, a place called The Big Bang, that was the uh, brand of piano bar that we had here in Nashville and still have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for a little under a year and got a call. I was pulling out of a Target and my phone lit up and it, was, it said Tony Higby. And Tony Higby is a guy, um, he works for, uh, like the boutique section at Guitar Center. That's how I knew him anyway. Okay. But he also plays guitar for a guy named Tom Kiefer, who was the original singer for the band Cinderella. Cinderella, I'm, yeah. I'm circling back. And um, he was like, hey, uh, Cher, Pete, or Cher Ross from Vixen is looking for a keyboard player that can also do tour managing duties. Is that something you're interested in? Have you done that before? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I had done tour managing stuff for Pomeroy and stuff, but not like, at the level of who where Vixen is really, but I mean, sure. like, how hard that be is hotels and backline stuff and whatever. I'll figure it out, and I did. And I've been and so Britt Lightning, uh, our guitar player, and I both flew down to Florida to share his house, uh, the original bass player's house, and we auditioned at the same time. We both got the gig at the same time. We've been there ever since, and that was 2017. So that's kind of the short version of all that. Well, you, you said a couple of things that are interesting and it kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to ask about is you, you, you kind of found your way because Nashville is not a, a very warm, fuzzy town for, for newcomers. And you were talking about how you kind of got into these, these sideman jams and that kind of thing. How did you establish yourself in that area when you, when you first showed up? Well, like, who did you first connect yeah, with? So I was playing, Pomeroy was doing a reunion show in Kansas city. And that weekend, Jason Aldean was playing at the damn football stadium in Kansas City. So I called up Rich and I was like, hey, man, I want to come check that show out. I'd, I've never seen a stadium show before, like from a stage perspective. I think it'd be cool. He's like, bro, it's going to be the parking's crazy and blah, blah, blah. I won't even be able to see you. I'll just see you in Monday at Douglas Corner in, in Nashville. I was like, oh, OK, what's going on Monday? It's like this thing called Loud Jams. You got to go. And I was like, well, I haven't been home like for a week and my girl hasn't seen me. And I don't know, is, is there a different day I could do it? And he's like typical rich fashion. He's like, bro, you want to do all the things you say you want to do 
and you want to do all this stuff, I'll see you in a Douglas corner on Monday. I was like, okay. So I called a star and my girlfriend. I was like, so oh, Rich wants me to go to this thing in, in Nashville on Monday. I know I'm just getting back. I'm not even going to be able to see you Monday. And she's like, that's fine. Just go. So I did. And I went and I was like, I was watching them play all these really weird. So the, the show's put on by, Tra- at the time, Tracy Lawrence's drummer, Tom Hurst. It's called yeah. Live Jams, right? And they play all, it's basically like whatever Tom has on shuffle in his, you know, like on his iPhone or whatever, like in any given day. The the music is everything from like Sting to Suicidal Tendencies to like Depeche Mode to like, yes. I mean, it's just all over the place. Uh, we've done, we, we've done Winger. <laughs> we've done, uh, it's just, I, I, I don't know. It's ridiculous. Then I, I so I'm watching this show and I don't know any of the songs at first. <clears throat> And then I hear the guitar player, who's a guy named Chris Nix, jump into a riff from a song, a song called The Oaf by the band Big Wreck. And I was like, wait, nobody plays this. So I'm like, go from the back of the room. I like run up to the front of the room. I'm like, this is badass. And then I'm watching these guys just tear this song up and just do great. And this weird, this short little guy who kind of looks like John Belushi, but sings like badass was up there singing that song and his name's matt farley he's become a really good friend of mine but i remember just being like this is so weird and i made him and he's like man you look you look like a rocker you should go out to you know there's this thing in this place called uh dan mcginnis on tuesday nights called the rock and roll residency oh yeah guys playing like classic rock really really well you should go check it out I was like okay, that's cool. So I I went that to that the next week. So my my, my long story gets you know meandering is like <laughs> the, the the loud jams thing. So I meet Tom. I look at the poster and I'm like, that guy looks really familiar, man. Like who is that guy? Tom Hurst. So I Google him, and he played in Sister Hazel back when I used to we used to tour with Sister Hazel like with Pomeroy. And I was like, that's where I know that guy. So I'm like, go up to him like were you on the rock boat in 2004 and 2006? He's like, yep. And I was like, holy crap. So was I. And then, and then and he's like, and so was this guy and this guy. And they're like, this guy was in tonic and this guy was in better than Ezra. And we were all on that boat together. I was like, really? This is crazy. Okay. And that was my end with everybody. Like that gotcha. moment was a conversation of like, oh, hi, Kevin Murphy, who played in tonic. I watched you play this show, this set called Van Hazel where sister Hazel and, and, and you and like one of the guy from tonic played all Van Halen covers and it was gloriously badass. Like I was like, I, that was my favorite moment on the boat. And then, you know, so it's those kind of moments. And this is something I talk about a lot lately with people that are trying to figure out like how to reach people on that level. Or like um, the other day you mentioned Lizzie Hale and I was doing this yeah. show where I just sang with Lizzie Hale and I, at the, after the show we went to this bar next door and this guy was talking about we were just talking about like exactly what you and I are talking about right now basically and he's like yeah I don't know if today's gonna be a, the day I, I get to meet her and I looked over and I was like no probably not because she's surrounded by a million people right now and there you got to know when you have to be patient about that stuff and know when the right time to kind of reach out your hand and go, Hey, I'm so-and-so and and this is what I do. Otherwise, you know, just you're either not going to be memorable or you're going to come off like a weirdo or whatever it is. Like there's been, there was many times I was in this room with Billy Sheehan, who's like my favorite bass player ever. And, um, but didn't talk to him or didn't make the effort to speak to him. And then I finally got my moment when there was one day when there was a lot of people around and I was like, oh, hey, Billy, uh, you know, I'm Tyson Leslie. I I just kind of, I've been listening to you for a million years. I played with Paul and he's like, oh, you played with Paul. So that was a in, right? Yeah, it's a pretty, yeah. Saying that you played in a band with Paul Gilbert, it's a pretty good in. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, you kind of have to have that something in your back pocket, whether it, it, it may not be something like, that but it might be you know whether it's something like oh man i've got your first solo record that nobody else bought you know or just something like that that's kind of like an icebreaker of a a phrase yeah Uh, mutual friends you know oh i'm friends with uh i mean i'm now but i'm just saying using this example like oh richie cots and i are good friends and oh yeah well yeah you know so it's something like that that's going to connect a conversation that's going to take it further so those are the two things wait for your window once that window is there 
you know, I did this the same thing with Chris Daughtry the other day. And not, I don't want to be throwing a bunch of names around, but this just to illustrate points. Like, I had been in the room with that guy. I'd performed on stage with him, and I still never spoke to him because yeah. that's sometimes just how it is. It's like you're on stage, and then boom, they're gone, or you're gone, or whatever it is. So this time, I... I was like, oh, man, I'm still not going to connect with him because he's just surrounded by people all the time. And I, I said hi to him a few times and, and that night and just whatever. But to actually have a conversation with somebody in that scenario could be challenging. Yeah. So I saw at the end of the night, it was just him and his uh, manager, like getting ready to walk out. So the person I talked to, like, hold on a minute, I'll be right back. Went and chased him down real quick. Hey, man, it was great playing with you. Um, how's Marty doing? His new bass player is Lita Ford's old bass player. So he's a good friend of mine. So that was my end conversation. Right. So it's like, oh man, Marty's great. And blah, blah, blah. It's like, I'll make your number. I do this show called Rare Hair. Tell him about it, all that. And there it is. So that's how, that's kind of how that works. And so that all of those kinds of tools, networking has never been an issue for me or difficult for me because I love chatting with people about yeah. what we do. It's fun for me. It's, and I always learn something. It's educational for me too. So, I mean, I'm even talking to you by the end of this, I'm sure at some point there'll be something that I'll like, Oh yeah, that was pretty cool information. You know, that I didn't think about. I just listened to a, I was really, really frustrated this week on how some of my bands downtown were playing songs. I'm like, Jesus, don't these people ever listen to these damn songs? Like songs, come on. Yeah. Like there's not two choruses in this or there's not a, this or whatever, whatever. And I listened to an interview, um, uh, podcast uh, with my friend Phil Schaus, who plays with the band Accept. And before that, he played with Gene Simmons and Ace Freely. And he was talking about, I, I wanted to play those songs the way I would want to see them played by somebody else. I was like, that's pretty awesome. Like that. Okay. So let me go back to that. Because when I write my big rant about, which I'm going to, <laughs> about <laughs> people playing songs just completely bonkers downtown that have nothing to do with how the song goes, that's exactly the phrase I'm going to use. Like, don't respect the song and then play them like you would want to see them played. Or maybe you are playing them the way you say, and the way that you think that they're supposed to be played sucks. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually in the process of putting something together. And and one of the, the, the phrase I keep thinking about is uh, performing with the audience in mind. It's kind of like the, the mentality that, you know. Always, yeah. yeah. I mean, and especially with cover bands, because you can go, you can learn songs. Like I remember with the nineties band, like we would learn songs, like this song is going to go awesome. And it just would just tank. Yep. Like what? I thought they would love this song. It just did nothing. Like we didn't. And then I did this eighties band thing where I was just, you know, filling in and they tried maniac by from flash dance. They were like, this is going to be a dance floor filler. It did nothing. It completely shit the bed. And yeah. I was like, really? I was like, yeah, and they, they didn't, nobody cared. I was like, well, maybe it's just the age thing. You know, it had to have been or something like that. Like 20 somethings aren't, they didn't watch flash dance. They don't know. They probably don't even want to know what it is. So, yeah. um, but it's interesting because another song from that, decade you know, that i do play on a regular basis is time of my life from dirty dancing everybody oh, yeah. knows that song and everybody <laughs> knows the everybody every single never fails some guy always tries to lift a girl and falls on their you know and so <laughs> and it's hilarious it's great but it's like that's so that's always an interesting thing of trying to pick songs that are going to work and so for me especially in a broadway downtown nashville scenario i am looking at the room all the time Okay, we have fifty percent forty and over fifty percent like thirty and younger. So who do we want? Let's cater to the older people first mm -hmm. because they have money and they're gonna leave soon because they don't want to be out until one o'clock in the morning. These right. young people, if they don't want to hear Zeppelin and all this crap, they'll come back later or they won't. Who cares? Whatever. But if it's a room full of like if it's like 60%, 20 somethings, then I'm coming out with the middle and, and I'm coming out with, you know, friggin' whatever, Mr. Brightside and junk like that. Like I, I'm reading the room and I'm playing to the room and I'm thinking about tempos all the time. Like what song's gonna go right into the next one? So I don't have to stop this song and like have stage banter, you know, if I don't need to. Yeah. I like to keep things moving if I can. Which is again, like I said, that old that simplexity taught me back in the day. Like keep that dance floor moving. Think about your tempos. 
you got to ramp it up a little bit to the next song. Cool. Your drum will handle that, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, it's always pay attention to your audience for sure. Um, if you're a tribute band, you already know what your audience is going to be pretty much. Yep. You know, if you're, but if you're just like a variety cover band, what's your event that you're playing? What's the bar? Are you playing like a, you know, a honky tonk bunch of, redneck idiots or are you playing like the upscale snooty bar that serves martinis and stuff in the rich part of town you know it's like you got to think about that stuff so you can figure out what your figure out what your set list is going to be to cater to the audience that is potentially going to be there totally so um you're kind of talking about the jam thing and and the community thing because the reason why i i kind of stumbled upon you specifically and what you what you do was because of rare hair Okay. And for the uninitiated, can you kind of explain what Rare Hair is and how it how it came about? Sure. Well, that first jam that I did, Loud Jams, is how it came about. So Rare Hair was originally going to be a band that played deep cut 80s heavy metal, like 80s hair band music, for lack of better terminology. The Sunset, sunset Strip days of Headbangers Ball on MTV, Motley Crue, but deeper than that. You know, a lot, we really wanted to go in and play the songs that only the diehards would know. You know. That was the original idea. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, there's not a lot of people out there that really are going to bite on that to go see a band that does that stuff. Right. right? Like you're going to be playing to 20 people playing stuff by bands like Jet Boy and Love Hate and, you know, and, <laughs> right. and, and, and digging deep into that kind of 80s hair band vernacular of collection of bands. And so... After doing that jam a few times, I'm like, I think this idea would work well in this format instead. So I asked Tom about it on the Tracy Lawrence bus. I was like, hey, I've got this idea that I've been wanting to do something with. Do you mind if I uh, take your con- this concept of a jam and make and do it this over here? And he was, you know, he was pretty supportive of it uh, at first. <laughs> so we did the first one at Douglas Corner, the same place that we had done the loud jam shows. But this one was a little different because we had Paul Taylor from Winger on the show, and we had Eric Brenningham from Cinderella, and we had Anthony Corder from a band called Tora Tora, who were all introduced to me from uh, this lady, Brandy Goldsboro, who lives here. And it was jam packed. It was like, it was way, it was uncomfortably packed full of people. And holy crap, this might actually turn out to be a thing. This is cool. And the second show we did, uh, Faster Pussycat, the band was coming through town and needed a date. And they were wanting the same date as our show. And I was like, oh, man, that'll kill our show. So like, I hit up the promoter. I was like, what if we combine the shows? Like, what if Faster plays first? They can play their set, get paid, and then they just hang out and party. And if they want to jam on the jam, then cool. If not, whatever. And so they did, and they they all did. They all pretty much came up and played in something, and it was a really. And we did. That's when we started doing it at the Basement East. At that point, I was doing it at a different venue every single time. That way, I could get to know the venue owners and the venue right. staff, and, and who are these people, you know, and who who am I? And when they saw that I could bring a crowd and stuff like that on this weird new show it was successful right out the gate and that's kind of how it got started i mean now it's like this monstrosity i think now, the yeah, last one was like four was, hours long with like we did five hours it was a little <laughs> too many actually but <laughs> and that was a weird it is that was me trying to scale things down and i and it just became impossible because of the guests that were involved and wanted to get in, in into it and so, yeah, we started out with those three kind of rock star guys. And then it just, every once in a while, like in the third show we did, had guys from Skid Row and we did a little Skid Row set at the end. And that was super fun. Because nice. um, two of the guys from Skid Row live in Atlanta and one of them lives here. Yep. And so they all came and did their thing and that was awesome. And then uh, the fourth show we did, I wanted to reach into the thrash and speed metal world. And so it was all like Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, Slayer, it's Testament, and all those kinds of bands. And although that was a lot l- less attended and I had to get, man, that one was really hard to staff musically too, because especially for drummers, not a lot of drummers, even as great as some of these drummers are that can do, you know, they can play all the crazy complex jazz stuff and all this stuff, but 
playing like Dave Lombardo. Nope. You know, those guys just don't have the yeah. footwork. They don't, they're not double base guys. A lot of these guys, yeah. so it's like, that was a whole different, like, okay, who in this town can play this stuff? And so I, I, I reached out and, and, and got recommendations from other folks. I'm like, and found a whole new crop of players that play this kind of stuff. I'm like, Oh, yeah. cool. So there is a metal scene here in this town that like a metal metal scene. And I was yeah. like, okay. That's cool. And it's just continued to grow. We just did our 15th show in December and we had 135 musicians on the show. Many of whom I would say maybe a fourth of them were kind of established rock stars in their own sense. And we had the bass player from Bon Jovi, you know, and stuff like, you know, they're all like side guys in a way. They're not like necessarily all, always the name guys. Like we have this guy, Jason, who plays keyboards for Journey. He's not Jonathan Kane. He's the other guy sure, playing sure. keyboards, right? He's the guy that doesn't have the spotlight on him all the time or whatever. And so those kind of moments to, for me, I get so much out of the charity thing came into play because I was like, I, I have to spend money to put that third show I did with Skid Row that cost me $500 mm-hmm. to bring in risers and do all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, how am I going to get paid back for this? <laughs> or am I, you know? And so I decided, because originally the first two shows were free. They didn't cost yeah, me. Yeah. So, um, cause that's how the loud jams was. So I, I honestly, I just, I did really kind of just steal a lot of Tom's ideas. And I realized that it's not fair to ask a bunch of people to come play for free and take the money for myself. Right. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm spending a lot of money trying to make this work. Like, in advertising and things like that so i started charging a cover and the way to get around it was i just pick a different local based charity every single show and so i get my expenses paid back and then everything yep. that's left over just gets sent to whoever so we've done suicide prevention we've done an old dog shelter we've done like a wildlife conservation thing that michael wagner chose when we did the show with him that's what he wanted to do We've done, man, all kinds of stuff. And it's been really cool. There's this one organization um, that just helps homeless kids and and also like kids that are just not doing well in school to kind of get mm-hmm. better. That, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So every time I just Google or sometimes I'll just put on Facebook, I'll just say, hey, name your favorite local charity. And I'll just look through them. I'm like, that one looks cool. Let me check this out. And I'll look and see what they do and then reach out to them and then – cool, we're good to go. And that's how that kind of also is. Because this last show cost me $6,500 yeah. <laughs> to put on. Because I flew in guys from LA and from Vegas and from Connecticut and, and Kansas City and Minneapolis. And now that costs a lot of money. So, And then put them in hotels. You know, it's just... So, and, and it's all gamble. Like, I put it all on my credit card and hope that people show up to the show and <laughs> I can pay it yeah. back. So, that's... But it's a labor of love because there's nothing more fun to me anyway, or very few things that are more fun than just seeing a bunch of musicians from every walk of life, your Broadway guys and your rock star, like legitimate rock star and country star guys. And um, to, you know, your studio musicians and stuff all thrown in a pot playing a bunch of 80s metal. (laughs) I think it's (laughs) hilarious and fun. And I love, and it's all about community building because a lot of us, we don't get to see each other except for these kinds of things because we're all playing on the same nights and stuff. So, Well, it's a, so, a joke that I, I, I talk I about with musicians. is like guitar players are used to hanging out with each other because odds are there's going to be more than one of them on a gig. But if you're a drummer or a bass player, yeah, the, the likelihood of you running into another one at a gig you know, is, is a lot lower depending on the lineup. So, And, and you know, this, this show and all the stuff that we do is all about building community so you know the fact that you're able to go into a super cutthroat city put on an event that features a bunch of hot shot musicians from all walks of life and make it this super fun almost like summer camp kind of vibe because i mean i yeah. i have a lot of mutual friends that are a part of that you know nick felici and jeremy barber and stuff who have played oh, on these oh. these previous dates <laughs> and stuff and it's just it's this really cool event that happens and um everybody seems to look forward to it and it's like this really cool opportunity for musicians in a very industry focused city to just have fun yeah which is just awesome all we do we just 
you know, show's over. All right, see you next time. That's it. You know, it's not, there's no, I mean, yeah, yeah there's a, an element of business sometimes. Some, maybe some people, there have been fa- bands formed because they've met each other at my shows. And that is awesome. Um, I do a similar one in Kansas City called Purple Jam. Mm-hmm. It's all Prince music. Yeah. And there was a band called Superstar Mafia that formed because they all met at, at the jam. And that, I mean, that's, that's a great compliment to, to the show when people form things or because they met at the, at my show. I love that. Yeah. That's super fun. Awesome, man. So uh, what's on the horizon for you? What's coming up in your world that you've got um, on the, to talk man, about? Life gets interesting. You know, this year I wanted, I spent so much time playing and learning other people's songs all the time. And I very seldom get to play my own and or be creative these days. But this year, I want to focus a little more on that. I, the last time I released a song was January 1st last year in 2022. Yep. And that in itself, like we were talking about Billy Sheehan earlier, <laughs> Billy played on the song. And so did Roxy from Vixen and um, my friend Jimmy Bell from a band called Autograph and Todd LaTorre from Queensryche, the current singer, and myself yep. co-wrote the song. And I haven't done anything since then at all. Like I had the whole year, not a single song. And so this year, you know, when I went over to Lizzie's house to do the rehearsal for that show the other day, I was like, I saw the piano that's always in the pictures on the Instagram. I'm like, I want to write a song with you on this piano. She said, let's do it. And I'm like, okay, when do we get back from New Zealand? And I get back from all these cruises and stuff like that. So writing is something that I really want to do more of this year with other people and putting out more songs like I did last last year. But as far as coming up right immediately, I've got the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp this weekend with Vicky Peterson from the Bengals, and Winona Judd will be there Sunday. Lizzie Hill will be there on Saturday. Uh, Samantha Maloney, you and I were talking about before we started recording from the band Hole, and Motley Crue for that matter. And a handful of other people will be here, so I'll be helping out on the production end of that. I'm not like or in it or anything because it's for women so right. I'm stoked about that and then Saturday I fly down to Orlando and we do the ship rocked cruise which I've done three years in a row now this will be my fourth year I think mm-hmm. and when that ends on the 28th I get off that boat and drive to Miami and get on the Moody Blues cruise, which is called now called On the Blue, because I don't think Moody Blues is really a thing anymore. So two very, very, very different cruises. One's all like butt rock metal kind of stuff. And the other one is all like late 60s, early 70s, like Alan Parsons <laughs> and, and Donovan and junk like that. So it's a very eclectic couple of weeks coming up. And then February, I'm just home in Nashville playing six nights a week like I always do. <laughs> and then when Vixen Machine starts up in March with the 80s cruise, which is the first time we've ever done that. And I'm super excited about that because Devo is on it and Morris Day at the time. Like so many of my yeah. favorite artists ever are on there. So I'm super stoked about that. And then we have an event called Rockin' Pod, which you should be involved in if you haven't been yet because I've it's for podcasters. We've talked with Chris a, a little bit, haven't quite figured out about hopping on, but there's definitely conversations going on. Yeah, that's happening um, March 17th through the 19th. So um, in fact, uh, I'll be working. On, and so we do a rare hair show on that Friday um, mm-hmm. every time, like for the pre-party. And then Saturday and Sunday, I'll be there just kind of helping out and everything and being part of the whole deal. And I unfortunately won't be at the Rare Hair show this time because Vixen's in New Mexico that night. So I've got my buddy Jack Ivans from that put on the show that I did with Lizzie a couple of days no, ago. I know Jack. Yeah, so Jack is running it. He's going to handle everything that day. Awesome. And then after that, it's just kind of like sporadic Vixen dates throughout the year. We're going to Brazil, and then I'm jumping on the Monsters of Rock cruise on the first stop, I believe. Because we're doing, I got dueling pianos on there as well as a rare hair show that I do on the Monsters Cruise every year, which is awesome and super fun. And then that's about it, man, uh, as far as like what's definitively on the calendar at the moment. Yeah. Then, and all the other stuff that just kind of falls in your lap over the course of Yeah. Yeah. So, like Vixen dates, they just come in every month, you get more dates. And it's like, okay, we're going to be this, but you know, in February, hey, you're going to be these places in June and July. And then yeah. usually, yeah. like around the summertime, Here's where you're going to be in October, November, December. So, totally. So, so when you when you were 
talking through that, another thing popped in my head is like, uh, and this is something, this is a question for people listening to this as much as it is a question that I could use <laughs> some good information on. Yeah. How do you handle the the workload and, and the potential for burnout? How do you keep your kind of head in the game when you're doing all of these different kinds of gigs? That's, um, that's kind of what keeps me from burning out is because they're different. Variety of it. So I'll play with different bands downtown. Because if I just play with the same band downtown, man, I get, oh, I, I just get totally fried. I'm like, okay, here we go. Jesse's girl for the 90 millionth time. And here's Sweet Child of Mine for the 90 billionth time. But when you play the same song with different people and they have a different vibe on it and stuff like that, that sometimes can be exciting you know or or keep it from being monotonous it's still the same damn song but at the same time it that helps me a little bit and then just like even with vixen like uh, uh, if i'm being honest like i uh, vixen's played almost practically the same set since i joined the band i mean we've we've changed some songs out here and there but for the most part it's it's very very much the same yeah and so you know when we're doing too much with vixen it gets like okay here we go you know, it's it, and 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 those are even in the same order. Whereas downtown, they're not always. Yeah, it's easy to get burned out. But when I start feeling that way, I'll back some stuff off, and I'll start getting more picky about what I want to do. I'll pick the stuff that I love more over the ones that I have to do, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Right now, my current schedule is a little wonky. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm usually uh, I, I'm obviously not there now, but Kid Rock's on the rooftop. And that band's fun because we play all kinds of variety of stuff from Renegade to um, Carry On, Wayward Son, all that stuff. We also have this whole like 80s dance set of Girls Just Want to Have Fun and Heaven's a Place on Earth by Belinda Carlisle and, and stuff that nobody else plays. And that is fun and doesn't get old. Like we play Beat It by Michael Jackson instead of Billie Jean. Or we play yeah. You Give Love a Bad Name instead of Living on a Prayer. Whatever. So they are still hits and this stuff, but they're not the stuff that's just been overplayed or overplayed to death. So oh, yeah. that, that I really dig. And then Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays, I play with a variety of different bands. One guy's named Josh Page, and he kind of plays the same old crap songs. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, these are, you know, and sometimes we'll even play those songs. Like the other day we played Man, I Feel Like a Woman. Like we played that. And then one other song, and somebody brought money. To, I'm like, were you just not here when we just played this song like two songs ago? <laughs> or are you just deaf and dumb and not paying attention? But okay, here we go again, and we play it again. And it's just like, I, as an audience member, I'm thinking, why are we doing Like, no, let's go. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, it's whatever. It's You got to make the money down there. That's kind of how the name of the game there. Customer service, yeah. Um, but then I, I play with another band called Hippies and Cowboys, which is kind of new for me. And these guys play everything wrong, everything. Like they, they, I, and they're I, they're wonderful human beings. But I'm just like, where did you come up with some of these crazy arrangements of stuff, man? Because as a guy coming in to fill in, I can't follow because I know the song how it goes. But you ain't playing it that way. But I'll just right. follow you, and hopefully we'll get to the end. And now I've played with them enough where I'm like, okay, I know where they're gonna go with it all, you know, and um. But those guys are tremendously good with the audience. Um, the singer Aaron is astoundingly good with um, – he's cocky. He's kind of got that Kid Rock kind of bravado thing going on. But it's not – I don't know. It's not so much that it turns me off. Usually stuff like that turns me off. But it, he's just – it's fun and he brings in that – he just brings that energy that – uh, uh, very few front guys into this town do. So I could see why they got, you know, I remember when they first started playing the main stage of Kid Rocks, I'm like, God, how'd they get that gig so fast? Cause they are pretty new. Yeah. And I did that first show with them. Like, Oh, okay. I get it now. <laughs> These guys are pretty awesome. Yeah. And they really bring a fun show and they bring out smoke machines. They bring out, they go the extra mile to make it a show. And I love that about them. And so, um, so when I play with them, um, even though I'm like, I'm always on my toes. I'm like, where are they going to go with this song? Cause they're probably not going to play it that way. I'm used to playing it. Yeah. And then also in addition to that, I'm the old guy in the band with well, me and Scott, the drummer. 
and I'm and Scott's got a ton of energy. I'm like, I got to bring my energy up level to these guys because otherwise, I just look like the tired old dude in the corner playing keys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, and then there's one other band, uh, a guy named Seth Carlson that I play with at Tootsie's every once in a while on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and that band is just full of monstrous musicians. So that one's that. That's where I get my super nerdy, monstrous musician fixes with those guys from time to time, where we just we can overplay tastefully <laughs> and have fun with it. Yeah, you know. So it's that variety of people that keeps it entertaining for me, and awesome. keeps me from being like, oh. But don't, don't get me wrong. As I've gotten older, the last damn thing I want to do, usually like right now, like right this second, I'm. Yeah, getting yeah. in my car and driving down 40 minutes downtown. And I'm just like, yeah. uh, I'd rather just watch, you know, sit in my underwear and watch Netflix and have my, you know, hang out with my wife and my dog. <laughs> but here I go playing, you know, girls just want to have fun again. But it, at the same time, like it's January and so many of my friends are hurting, you know, for work yeah. and not working or whatever when i was living in kansas city for a little while because i had to move back there about a year yeah. ago from how my parents dude i would wake up every monday on in january with an overdrawn account like not even exaggerating every monday i'm like crap yeah i gotta work i gotta find work and then as soon as i move back here i'm like boom right back to work six nights a week yeah. like so i do not take that for granted i count my blessings on that for sure yeah but i also work hard to get there you know i i, I spend the time like this, this thing is sitting here because I'm sitting here programming, meticulously programming sounds into it, so I can sound like the rec- recordings of these songs that I'm playing, you know. And so yeah, my, my stop is right over there. <laughs> yeah, my keyboard is the same thing. Like I'll go on. I, I, I spent yesterday a good portion of yesterday just with a flash drive and a memory stick and uploading a ton of sa- new samples into it for songs that we're doing, and so and then I've got to do that tomorrow for Shiprock because I'm. Playing with all these rock stars on ship rock, and I want to not suck on that. You know, I want to sound good. I want people to go, "Damn, you, you made that sound just like the record." I'm like, damn right, I did. You know, because I take pride in, in that. I think about like just respect the song for what it is and the people that create. Oh, yeah. I think it's cool to play 100%. it as close as you can, and I think that's why Ninety Minutes was so the band was so successful. We took we spent a lot of time. An effort trying to make those songs sound exactly like they you would hear them on the radio and um we had a singer both between me and the singer that was in the the other singer we we were really good at mimicking the voice and the vocal styles of the people that we were covering too and i love that about about jason and myself and even john this other guy john like we give john all the jackal and the you know, the what Rob's on, he's got this gritty voice and stuff. So we, we give him all that stuff, you know. And then we had Josh at the time, wasn't the greatest singer. He's a lot better singer now, but then he was not that great. So we gave him all the rap songs and the Raising Us Machine songs and the stuff that you didn't require a lot of singing, singing and stuff. You know, the strengths and weaknesses of the people in your band and you bring out the best out of them by, by giving them the material that they're going to do best at. Totally. Well, all right, man. If anybody wants to get in touch with you or see what you've got going on, what's the best way for them to find you? Um, just Google my name, <laughs> just Tyson <laughs> Leslie, because I, it's one of the nice things about having a name that's not like John Smith or something like that. Like Adam Johnson checking in here. Yeah, right Adam John- <laughs> totally that. So, I mean, if you just Google my name, all my social stuff will come up. Plus everything like Instagram and Facebook, everything's Tyson Leslie. It's awesome. awesome. Well, Tyson, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me this evening. I got to do it. We've been talking about it for a long time. It's been a long time coming. So I'm very, very grateful for you. So appreciate you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Right on.